Welcome everyone. We are honored to host the Queer Russophone Poetry in Reading and Translation. Anne Fisher will be uh, given a full introduction for each poet and translator. And I just want to thank everyone who could make it, including our audience. Um, and just tell you a few words about Globus Books, which is an independent bookstore in San Francisco. We've been around since 1971, and it's quite an iconic spot. We carry books on all possible subjects about all things Russia and the former Soviet Union, the countries that used to be the republics of the Soviet Union. We have history, philosophy, literature, poetry, a massive collection on uh, literary criticism and scholarly works. And you can just come and visit our website or come and visit it when the quarantine is over. And I just want to say that this is a first event in our series of poetry and translation. So visit our YouTube channel. And I'm very happy to introduce Anne uh, Fisher, who is the brain and the soul behind this reading. Thank you, Anne. Yeah, if not for you, that wouldn't be possible. And Anne is... Um, a writer and translator, and uh, she is known for her translations of journalism, such as Monitor One by uh, Shura uh, Burtin. We know the inaugural True Story Award for Long Form Journalism, Nervous, a one act play by Julia Lukshina, and Poetry and Prose by Ilya Danishevsky, who will be joining us shortly as well as Dmitry Kuzmin in the folio that Fisher co-edited. So thank you, Anne, and please help us welcome all the participants. Thank you, Zarina. This is a really fantastic opportunity for us, and uh, we're really excited to be able to promote um, some of our amazing authors. This presentation is going to be in three parts. The first part is uh, just readings. The second part will be uh, talking about translating and Ilya can maybe tell us about what it's like to be translated um, because he's with us live. Thank you very much, Ilya. And the third part will be uh, sort of talking about the social context of, of queer poetry in Russia and in Russian language today. Um, so to start out with, I'll um, introduce briefly our first set, uh, our first translator for our first pair, and then I'll introduce our second translator when they go, and then I'll introduce our third translator when they go. Well, our first translator is Alex Karsavin, who's a translator and writer based in Chicago and New York. Uh, they are poetry editor and translations editor at Hom Intern Magazine, which is a new magazine that I had not heard of, and it's fascinating, so if you don't know about Hom Intern, definitely check it out. Um, and uh, in their academic and literary work, uh, Alex explores the channel ways between queer poetics, Marxism, and environmental history. Uh, looking forward to your debut uh, book of poems coming out soon, Alex, and um, you can take it away. Okay, thank you, Anne. Um, our first author will be Ilya Danishevsky. Uh, Ilya Danishevsky is one of the best known and youngest literary editors in Russia formerly in charge of the alternate publishing project An Anadonia at the leading publishing house, AST. Tanishevsky writes texts that blur the boundary between poetry and prose, produces regular literary features for the online edition of the journal Snob, and curates the literary program at Moscow's Vaznitsyansky Center. Ilya's work is steeped in contemporary Russian pop culture and queer subculture, as much as it is in literary and cultural theory. Manaligan Chain's Tanishevsky's second book is a concept book composed of hybrids, Half the characters are prose, the other half are free verse. Half the chapters are prose, the other half are free verse, sorry. It asks how we live with violence, both that, which, both that which we commit and that which we receive from ourselves, family, friends, strangers, the body politic, and the regime. The personal as is the political. The story takes place as a series of narrative threads, including erotic and platonic love, friendship, trust, childhood trauma, death of friend, siblings, and the dog annexation of both concrete geopolitical territories and abstract personal ones, and a commercialized, politicized death of Russian soldiers fighting in Ukraine, all loosely overlaid onto a personal journey. The three verse chapters all go back to the archetypal journey narrative of the Odyssey, with subtitles like the Little Cedars, the Astragonian, Circe, etc. Good morning, America. We have a deep night. In the Prayom Mitzini, we divide the late night где длинные дети с трикос ловят своих головастиков и цехилицерами сквозь мембраны. 
И просто обернись. И нет, потому что дым может прятаться на щеки капилляры. И капилляры рабочих бумажных студентов, и прилежные доводы разума, и прилежные сбои сердца. И тех, кто ходил смотреть вдоль волчьих ягод в сугестии ржавых заборов. И тех, кто ходил смотреть воробья в искусственном драпе пропивы бумажных его тетрадей. И еще под сутулым небом и летнего жара, втянутого для и вылитого наружу. Не совпадая с шагом рабочего, избитым прицелом студента, покупателя кофе и следующего длинноты дискурсивного поля Антарктики. Или Арктики, или где там пингвины, с делением паузы жеста, в просветах длинных детей стрекоз и вязаных шапках, с подвязками и в словах, с резинкой, сквозь рукава. И другие дела. И просто обернись, и нет. Это не та рука. Или уже не та. Shadows of Rubutabor. Over the woods there are shadows, creating summer fat, where the gangling dragonfly children catch tadpoles and their chilisseria pierce membranes. All you have to do is turn around and there will be nothing, because smoke can hide capillaries in the night. The capillaries of workers and parchment students can hide the mind's diligent arguments and the heart's diligent stutterings. And those who went to sea, skirting alongside the wolfberry bushes, a swarm and a suggestion of rusty fences. Those who went to see a sparrow under the fake drapes of nettle in his loose leaf shroud, who went under the stooped sky and the summer heat drawn in and exhaled. Out of sync to the pace of the worker and the misaligned sights of the student, the buyer of coffee or the researcher, the extent of the discursive field of the Antarctic or Arctic or wherever there's penguins. The pauses in our gestures divvy into glistening gaps, glimpses of gangling dragonfly children and the pan-lit beanies firmly fastened under the chin, and words secured in a string slipped through each sleeve, and so on. And all you have to do is turn around and know that's not the right hand, or not anymore. Почти каждый день я прихожу к нему и трем его братьям, а в другие дни приходим ко мне. Самый младший всегда лезет обниматься, мы смотрим лонгольеры, большие комки плоти поедают время, гоняются за экипажем корабля, большие дворовые собаки, как бы вывернутые наизнанку, только липкая сторона и слюни. Он спрашивает меня, как это, летать на самолете. Я рассказываю. Когда я прихожу, его, его мать всегда завязывает волосы косынкой. Она тоже смотрит с нами фильмы, игнорируя их возрастные ограничения. И иногда слышно, как она плачет на кухне. Мы увеличиваем звук, чтобы не вторгаться к ней. Чтобы она, с одной стороны, знала, что мы знаем, а с другой, что не знаем всего от начала и до конца. На контрольной по математике мне решают писать оба варианта, чтобы его не избил отец. Потом мы идем по улице, когда теплеет. Это может длиться очень долго. Он говорит, что будет продавать лохам шарики для пейнтбола, сотки, битки, карточки с покемонами и героями смертельной битвы. Потому что ему надо купить брат в Томагоч. Когда темнеет, мы иногда продолжаем ходить, скорее кругами вокруг неработающей котельной, разделяющей наши дома. Пока совсем темно, идем к нему, где мать укладывает его братьев. Смотрим фильмы без звука. Иногда на перемотки, только любимые моменты. Например, когда в звездном десанте жук мост всовывает, жгут в человеческий череп и высасывает нейроны. Или когда в лунатиках кто-то втыкает, смотрит у кладбища карандаш в уху. Его отец бреет меня машинкой, а мамы возит нас на большое озеро. Тихие огни растворяются, почему-то падают в воду. Хотя это должны быть светлячки или ошибки зрения дружбы, которые рассматривают через стекло. Я очень подробно смотрю, как он завороженно ловит рыбу. Это время, когда мы не разговариваем очень долго, хотя пустые водоемы отвлекают от времени. И хотя оно не пусты и почти ничего не ловится, словно он держит удочку под неверным углом. А зиму проходит и еще. Далеко. Когда мы возвращаемся, он сразу идет домой, чтобы убедиться, что с матерью ничего не случилось. Когда мы гуляем вокруг котельной, его важно смотреть, как окна его квартиры светятся. Он любит смотреть сестру. Мутно, как вещи с глубоких слоев. Разглядывая, чтобы убеждаться. Он думает, какая из девочек должна ему нравиться. Потом, не принимающий решение, плавный запах осени. Он думает вслух о Насте, Полине, Маше. О том, а как что-то чпокается, издает звук, похожий на полиэтилен с пупырышками. И что-то между нами всегда происходит, когда он говорит их имена. Смотрим на большие скопления стоящей воды у железной дороги. Large stray dogs that have been turned inside out, leaving only the sticky side and drool. He asks me, so what's it like to fly on an airplane? I explain. Whenever I 
hair enough. His mother always ties up her hair with a scarf and then watches the same films with us, ignoring their age limitations, not to intrude. <laughs> we don't know it fully from beginning to end. When we take our math exams, I'm allowed to fill in both sets so that his father doesn't beat him. Afterwards, we walk down the street. If it's warmer out, this can go on for some time. He says that he will sell suckers, paintball capsules, milk caps, slammers, Pokemon, and Mortal Kombat trading cards because he needs to buy his brother a Tamagotchi. When it gets dark, we sometimes continue to walk, more often than not circling around the defunct boiler room separating our buildings. And when it becomes completely dark, we go to his, where his mother puts his brothers to sleep. We watch films with the sound off, sometimes in Rewind, only our favorite moments. Like for example, in Starship Troopers, the brain bug sticks its proboscis into a human skull and sucks out the neurons. Or in Sleepwalkers, when someone sticks a pencil inside the cemetery caretaker's ear. His father gives me a shave with electric clippers, while mine takes us out to a great lake. Quiet lights dissolving and for some reason falling to the water. Although, the, although they've got to be fireflies for the distorted vision of a friendship that's being examined under glass. It's in great detail I observe the fascination with which he fishes. This is a time when we don't speak for very long, although empty bodies of water distract us from time, and although they are empty and he hardly catches anything, as if he has been holding his fishing rod at the wrong angle, the azimuth leaving his avri somewhere far off. When we return, he immediately goes home to make sure nothing has happened to his mother. Sometimes when we're taking our strolls around the boiler room, it's important for him to notice how the windows of his apartment glow. He likes to remember his sister, hazy like an object from the earth's deepest layers that he re-examines for assurance. He thinks about which of the girls he should like, then come the sleek flows of autumn bearing an undecidable scent. He thinks out loud about Nastya, Polina, Masha, about how something's always sighing and popping, making a sound like bubble wrap how something always happens between us whenever he says their names. We stare at large accumulations of standing water by the railway tracks. Thank you, Alex and Ilya. That was beautiful. Now we will move on to Hila Cohen and Lido Yusupova. Hila Cohen is the news editor of Medusa in English, uh, the, which is the, the Anglophone edition of the Russian language news outlet. She works on the intersections of Russophone literature and politics, and this uh, she, her writings can also be found in Music and Literature, the Los Angeles Review of Books, and elsewhere. Uh, Hila's translations of Lido Yusupova's poetry are forthcoming in the Nashville Review. And are they already out, Hila? Oh, yeah. they are. Oh, would, would, perhaps you could put up a link if, if they're, if they're sure. available. Um, Hila, do you have any other projects to... Uh, to, to add to your list here. Emily Morris, who is also uh, with us, is, is going to read in a second, um, is editing a whole collection of Lido's poetry for Cicada Press. Um, and there are a few poems in there as well. So also in a different position now, with those and the, the features editor. But um, the translation of the poem that I'm about to read has come out then in the uh, National Review. Lido Supova, uh, as I think, um, as well as Snow has facilitated the rise of a new generation of queer Russophone poets. Um, she has a lot of journal publications, a few collections like Ritualsi 4, Dead Dad, um, and then this volume is coming out in English. And she lives in St. Pedro, Belize, and in Toronto, Canada. И красными красными губами. Рыжие волосы, прямая челка, красные губы. Она не смотрит в глаза, она тоже не улыбается, она спрашивает что-то. Я говорю, что вообще-то пришла сюда, потому что хочу написать для их информационного листка. Я говорю, что я хочу быть полезной, что я хочу быть полезной. Могу что-нибудь написать в информационный листок их организации. Я знаю, что они выпускают информационный листок. А я прочитала очень много книг на английском о феминизме, о истории феминизма и о современных проблемах, пока жила в Канаде. А также я прочитала много статей в газетах и вообще искала, поглощала информацию о правах женщин, о борьбе за права женщин, и о борьбе за права лесбиянок, геев, бисексуалов, транссексуалов, кверов плюс. Женщина с красными губами, глядя мимо, мимо меня, сказала, пойдемте, я познакомлю вас с председательницей, пойдемте на кухню. 
И мы вышли из библиотеки и пошли по длинному темному коридору. Справа еще одна большая комната, наполненная светом. Одна женщина сидит у двери за компьютером. Она внимательно посмотрела на меня. Та женщина, что открыла мне дверь, сидит за столом в центре комнаты. Она тревожно посмотрела на меня. Еще одна женщина стоит спиной ко мне, облокотившись о стол. И что-то говорит женщине, открывшей мне дверь. So that was an excerpt from Centrogendonic Problem, which was originally published on FB Small, which is itself an uh, online uh, magazine of feminist writing. And um, this is going to be a slightly larger portion of the English language translation, the Center for Gender Problems. I really wanted to meet lesbians and feminists, so I called an organization by the name of the Center for Gender Problems. Could I come to your library? My heart was beating so hard. I didn't need their books. I just wanted to meet lesbians and feminists. I wanted to be useful for feminism. And also, I realized I was a lesbian, but I did not know a single other lesbian. So I really wanted to meet lesbians and feminists, and I called an organization by the name of the Center for Gender Problems. Could I come to your library? It was January of 1999. I'd come back to Russia from Canada, where I had read a whole lot of books about feminism in English. I thought I had a lot of useful knowledge I could share. There was almost no internet back then. Then there's a whole portion that has to do with the journey through the streets and the Leningrad siege and all kinds of different things. But ultimately, um, the narrator ends up inside this apartment. I heard a voice behind the door, a low voice. The door opened and there appeared a tall woman with red hair and red, red lips. Red hair, straight bangs, red lips. She didn't look me in the eyes. She also didn't smile. She asked me something. I said, I basically came here because I want to write for your newsletter. I said, I want to be useful. I want to be useful to your feminist organization. And I can write something for your organization's newsletter. I know that you publish a newsletter and I've read a whole lot of books in English about feminism, about the history of feminism and about current issues while I was living in Canada. And also I read a lot of articles in the newspapers and generally looked up, gobbled up information about women's rights and about the struggle for women's rights and about the struggle for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transsexual, queer plus rights. The woman with the red lips looked past me and said, let's go, I'll introduce you to the chairwoman, let's go to the kitchen. And we left the library and walked down a long, dark corridor. On the right, another large room full of light. One woman was sitting by the door in front of the computer. She looked at me intently. The woman who opened the door for me was sitting at a table in the middle of the room. She looked at me anxiously. And one more woman was standing with her back to me, leaning her elbows on the table and saying something to the woman who opened the door for me. And there I was in the kitchen, a long table. The red-headed woman said that her name was Valya and offered me tea. Yes, thank you. She lit a gas stove and put a green enamel kettle on the deep blue flame. She left. And on the way to the kitchen, I saw a label on the door of another room. I thought, this is the lesbian society I came here for in the first place. Yes, yes, it was all a lie. I'm not that interested in writing for their feminist newsletter, though maybe I am, but not that much, not that much. And it's so important, so important to me to meet lesbians. I want to meet feminists too, but lesbians are more important to me because maybe, maybe after I meet them, a new life will begin for me. I came to the Center for Gender Problems, but not to write for feminism. I came only for myself. Yes, I came here because I want love and sex with a lesbian. Yes, I came here for love. That's my problem. I came here for love. I went into the lesbian society's room. It was smaller than the library, and by then the weather had changed, or the sun had changed places, or the sun had started, the sunset had started even, but it was dusky in the room. And when I went in, three pale faces shot upward over an open magazine or photo album or some kind of big book as though the faces were shining. How could they read in this half darkness? They were probably looking at the pictures. All three women had their hair cut identically, very short. Then I had long hair and a ponytail, and also I had makeup on. And of course, they had no makeup on at all, of course. And I was all heterosexual looking, and I smiled. They, of course, did not smile. They looked at me, no, not with irritation, with tension. Yes, with tension and indifference. What did I want? What did I hope for? What did I expect? That they would open their arms, literally open their arms to me, their hearts? That they would just like that lift their faces to me, lift their gazes? to me and smile and their eyes would shine and they would stand and walk toward me spreading their arms wide like crabs or something. Oh, I don't even remember what I asked. Maybe it was about the magazine or organization published a magazine. I knew everything. Yes, because I had been preparing for this moment for two years. I did research on the internet and the library in Toronto. I didn't have my own computer. I dreamed about this moment for two years. They said there was no magazine anymore or something like that. I don't remember, but it meant that there was nothing for me to do there. And I went out of that room and never went back in there again in my life. 
Vaya made me tea, and we started drinking tea. That was back when they still made little pots of strong tea and diluted it. We started drinking tea and talking. We talked for a long time. Valia said she would go and find out when Olga was free, and she left. A figure was sitting on a chair by the entrance to the kitchen, just sitting there waiting for someone. I asked, are you waiting for Olga too? And the figure turned sharply toward me and said sharply, I'm not from here, and turned back around. Later, I found out it had been Masha Gessen. I mean, I heard the name, but I didn't know who Masha Gessen was. And then later, Masha Gessen got famous. Finally, the chairwoman Olga appeared. She started talking to Masha Gessen. By then it was already dark outside. They turned on the light in the kitchen. There was just one single little lamp, yellow light and shadows on the walls. Olga said loudly, who wants wine? Someone gave me wine and pulled red wine out of the fridge and put it on the table. She opened it. Masha didn't want wine, but I asked, could I have a little? I asked smiling, could I have a little? And Olga looked at me, stared at me heavily and said no and kept drinking wine alone. Alhila, thank you very much. Um, I almost feel like I was there, uh, being welcomed or maybe not so welcomed. As you got, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, that was great, thank you. Um, and um, now we have our, our third and final pair. Uh, Ainsley Morse is going to read from her translation of Aksana Vasyakina's work. Um, I, I will just introduce Ainsley uh, briefly. Um, she teaches at Dartmouth College. Ainsley uh, translates Russian and former Yugoslav literatures. Uh, Ainsley has such a long list of translations, I, I honestly don't know where to begin. So I will just say that most of the awards or, or publishing houses that are out there, Ainsley has, has won them or been published by them. And um, we're very glad that you could join us today, Ainsley. I'll be reading some excerpts today from a long poem by Oksana Vasyakina. Oksana was born in 1989 in Siberia. She's a poet, activist, curator, and feminist. She graduated from the Gorky Literary Institute in Moscow, and her first book came out that year, 2016. It's called uh, Women's Prose, Zhenska Proza. And the poem I'll be reading from was also, I think, first published in 2017. It was one of the poems selected by Ilya, who we have with us today, um, for, for his snob, snob blog. Um, um, and I, I believe it's part of Aksana's second collection, which uh, came out in book form, uh, which is called Vietr Yaristi. Uh, the poem is called These People Didn't Know My Father. Eti Liudi Niznali, my Vodza. And the translation I'll read from was done by me and Eugene Ostashevsky. The full translation will come out in an anthology of contemporary feminist poetry that I'll probably say something about later in our discussion. Привет, San Francisco. Я прочту несколько фрагментов из цикла стихотворений Эти люди не знали моего отца. Это стихотворение поймут только те, кто имеет отношение к актуальной поэзии. Сказать вернее к тому ее сегменту, который представляет поэтесса Лида Юсупова. И еще около 50 поэтов и поэтесс, чьи книжки продаются в независимом книжном магазине «Порядок слов» в фойе электротеатра. Особенно перед спектаклем очень много людей, и все берут поддержать маленькую страшную книжечку Лиды. Берут ее с самого видного места, открывают и сразу закрывают, и кладут обратно. А потом оглядываются украдкой по сторонам. Не видел ли кто, что они взяли в руки голубую книжечку с телом отца Рона Мьюрика? Я знаю, эта скульптура на самом деле очень маленькая, как и все мертвые люди. Рон Мьюрик говорил, что когда увидел своего отца мертвым, этого сильного большого человека, он удивился, какой же он стал маленький и сухой, когда умер. Когда я видела мертвым своего отца, Я вспомнила, что нужно поддержаться, поддержаться за ноги, чтобы не бояться. Так говорила покойная тетка. Она говорила, если боишься, подойди и возьми за ноги. И я подошла и взяла его за носки ботинок. Я почувствовала своими пальцами пустоту под твердым кожзамом и подумала, наверное, они купили ему самые дешевые ботинки из всех, что были в ритуальном агентстве. И прикинула, стоили они рублей 300. Теперь на его ногах весят примерно как воздух. Я посмотрела на него, когда поняла, что не страшно. И на самом деле было с самого начала не страшно, но нужно было выдержать ритуал. Я посмотрела на него, подумала, какой странный, похожий на папье-маше, но не маленький, а пуской. 
люди отбрасывают эту книжечку серо-голубую, как если бы это был чей-то носовой платок или порно-картинка в конверте. Но это поэзия. Они ее стесняются, думаю я. This poem will make sense only to people who have something to do with contemporary poetry, or really with that segment of it that's represented by the poetess Lidia Yusupova and another 50 or so poets and poetesses whose books are sold in the independent bookstore Word Order in the foyer of the Electro Theater. Especially before a show, there's always a lot of people and everyone picks up and holds Lida's tiny, frightening book. They take it from the spot where everyone can see it and open and close it right away and put it back and then look over their shoulders to see if anyone noticed that they picked up the baby blue book with Ron Muek's father's body. I know that this sculpture is actually very small, like all dead people. Ron Muek said that when he saw his father dead, this big, powerful man, he was surprised by how dry and small he became when he died. When I saw my own father dead, I remembered that you have to hold the feet so as not to be afraid. That's what my late aunt used to say. She used to say that if you're afraid, go up and take the feet. So I went up and grabbed the toes of his shoes. My fingertips felt the emptiness beneath the hard imitation leather. And I thought they must have bought him the cheapest shoes they had at the funeral home. And figured they must have cost around 300 rubles. Now on his feet, they weigh about as much as air. I looked at him when I realized it wasn't frightening. And in fact, it wasn't frightening from the beginning, but you had to carry out the ritual. I looked at him, thought how strange he looks, like paper mache, but not only not small, but empty. People fling aside this gray-blue little book like it was someone else's Kleenex or a porn pic in an envelope, but it's poetry. Still, they're embarrassed by it, I think. Мой отец был дальнобойщик. Он возил мертвых и живых кур, арбуз, трубу. Иногда по зимам, когда нечего было вести, он простаивал в степи неделями. Он ждал, когда выкопают трубу из совхозных песков. Он ждал неделями и смотрел, как степь меняется к ночи, а потом к утру, изо дня в день. Степь красива, и есть за что ее любить. Я люблю ее хотя бы за то, что на нее невозможно смотреть подолгу, становится страшно. Тоска закипает в груди, и хочется только бежать, и бежать, и бежать, и бежать, пока степь не кончится. После кур он вметал помет и тушки погибших в пути птиц вместе с соломой со дна своего кузова и говорил, что больше никогда не станет возить птицу. Лучше уж труба, она молчит и не смородит, не умирает. После арбуза он щурился от кислого запаха испорченных ягод и выметал осколки, зелен... осколки зеленых корок, черные семечки, побуревшую от жары мякоть с налипшими мухами и землей. Лучше уж труба, он говорил. Ее приходится ждать, но она не киснет и не смрадит. А после кур и арбуза еще до зимы все воняет. Хорошо, когда ветерок, а когда ветра нет, Стоять невозможно. Запах такой, что мужики ночью выгоняют со стоянки в степь. Там спать. Он умер от спида. Его похоронили над степью с видом на объездное шоссе. И теперь мне кажется, что он лежит и слушает степь, и ждет трубы. Там под землей у него портативный телевизор, радио и газеты, а еще молоко. И он ждет, когда поднимут все трубы со дна совхозных полей, тогда он погрузит трубу и поедет, повезет молчаливые трубы, тяжелые, ржавые трубы. My father was a long-haul truck driver. He hauled dead and live chickens, watermelons, pipe. Sometimes in winter, when there was nothing to haul, he would wait for weeks in a step, idle. He'd wait for the pipe to get dug out of the collective farm sands. He'd wait for weeks and watch the step change toward evening and then toward morning from day to day. The step is beautiful and there is reason to love it. I love it because for starters, it is impossible to look at for long. You get afraid, sadness wells up in your breast and you feel like just running and running and running until the step ends. After the chickens, he would sweep the droppings and the carcasses of the birds who died in transit along with the straw out from the cargo bed and say, that never again would he haul fowl. Even pipe is better. It doesn't make a racket or reek or die. After the watermelons, he'd squint from the sour smell of spoiled fruit 
and sweep out the shards of green rind, black seeds, flesh gone dark from the heat with flies and dirt stuck to it. Even pipe is better, he would say. You have to wait for it, but it doesn't go bad or reek. But after the chicken and the watermelon, it still stinks till winter. It's okay when there's a bit of wind, but when there's no wind, you can't stand around waiting. The smell is so bad that at night, the guys chase you from the parking lot out to the step to sleep there. He died of AIDS. They buried him over the step with a view of the bypass. And now it seems to me that he's lying there listening to the step and waiting for pipe. Under the ground there, he has a portable TV, radio, and newspapers, plus milk. And he's waiting for all of the pipe to be raised up from the depths of the collective farm fields. Then he will load up on pipe and go, haul the silent pipe, the heavy, rusted pipe. От спида умирает кто угодно. Чужие наркоманы, чужие рок-звезды, чужие манекенщицы, чужие геи, чужие люди. Но не чьи-то отцы и братья. Вот он умер от спида, и никто об этом не знает, и не узнает, если не прочтет этот текст. Потом удивился и сказальная версия о смерти моего отца, Менингит. От Менингита, от Менингита может умереть твой ребенок, твой отец, твоя мать, твоя сестра, твоя жена, твой муж, кто угодно твой. То, что он умер от спида, держится в строгом секрете. Мне непонятно зачем. Хотя, когда у меня редко спрашивают, от чего он умер, таким молодым, 47 лет, я смотрю на человека и думаю, что ему ответить? Не знаю почему. Но иногда мне кажется, что я думаю, что выбрать именно от того, что есть официальная версия. На самом деле, когда меня спрашивают, чаще всего я отвечаю, это была ВИЧ-инфекция. Это не так страшно звучит, как спид. От спида не умирает твой отец, а ВИЧ-инфекция может вызвать смерть твоего отца. Спасибо. Just about anybody can die of AIDS. Strangers who are drug addicts, strangers who are rock stars, strangers who are models, strangers who are gay, just strangers. But not somebody's fathers or brothers. He did die of AIDS, but no one knows it and won't find out until, unless they read this text. Because when his friend found out my father died of AIDS, he was stunned and said, but I drank from the same mug as him and no problem, I'm healthy. An official cause of my father's death exists, meningitis. Who can die of meningitis? Your child, your father, your mother, your sister, your wife, your husband, just about anyone who's yours. The fact that he died of AIDS is being kept strictly secret. I don't understand what for. Though on the rare occasions when people ask me what he died from so young, only 47, I look at the person and wonder how to answer. I don't know why, but sometimes I think I wonder what to choose precisely because an official cause of death exists. In fact, when people ask me most of the time, I say it was HIV infection. It doesn't sound as frightening as AIDS. Your father can't die of AIDS, but HIV infection could cause the death of your father. That was beautiful. Thank you. We'll have part two, the spotlight on translation, and then part three, the social context of uh, queer poetry in Russia and Rusev um, writing today.